I grew up in New York City, which in the 1930s was attended very much leftward. Not everybody, but a good portion of the population was left-leaning. It was a left center in the whole United States. And uh, I grew up in this atmosphere. Um, it, this means that, and not only that, but I'm old enough to have been uh, still as a, a relatively small child, but I still have a few recollections of the Big Depression. I asked my father, as I recall, going through the streets, I said, what are all those men waiting for? It's a long line, hand out of soup. And something else was typical of those days. People who looked unusually were college graduates selling apples on the street corner. They had a little stand selling apples, five cents an apple, They're very nice apples. This was, a, for many graduate classes, this is what their story was. <laughs> uh, we drove, uh, can they find seats? This one, they can sit there. Uh -huh, here are seats, yeah. There were, we used to, we had a very little bungalow in the country, very primitive little bungalow outside New York, 50 miles out, or 30 miles out. Uh, very, very inexpensive, but we had to drive past Newark, New Jersey. And I'll never forget, outside of Newark was a big, big, big stretch of land with all these self-made shanties. Primitive, like the favelas in, in, in Brazil, or slums in so many cities around, especially in the southern part of the world. And they, it stank to high heaven, and we passed this by every year. And uh, I have, still have these recollections. Plus, in 1937, the first newsreel that I can remember seeing showed the, the, the Flint strike. In Flint, Michigan, there was a sit-down strike in General Motors which, where the workers took over the General Motors factories. The police did everything to get them out. They, um, they uh, um, tried to starve them out. The wives and girlfriends managed to get food in. And when the uh, police tried to attack them once, it was the middle of a bitterly cold winter, they, they, they had a fire hose against the police, so they were able to stop them. But they held out for weeks and weeks and, and won. And this was a change, 1937. There were several big strikes in those mid-30s mid during the Depression. The first big one was San Francisco, actually. It was a general strike for several days. But this Flint strike in, in, in Michigan, by the way, it's where Michael Moore comes from, and he's written about it. Um, this really was a high point in changing the whole American economic system. Social security was obtained through the battles. Social security, uh, 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 old age insurance, the right to join a union. This is all up until then not present. During the mid 30s, and you had a president who was not uh, uh, no leftist exactly, but he listened to people and listened to people and got voted for by people. So it was able to push it through, which made for one of the strange ironies of history, that the relatively high standard of living, which was obtained in the United States, through, was obtained through a mostly left-wing led movement, largely communist in fact, not only, but largely communist, led this movement, which was a basis of the standard of living which was used after 1945 to tell the world, look how wonderful American capitalism is. <laughs> it's, it's really an irony of history, but that's what happened. So I'll get back to myself. Uh, I went to various schools, all different kinds, two very plush private schools, for two years each where I was the only leftist there. I had to defend, I had to defend, and I felt it necessary to defend the Soviet Union during that difficult time, that Hitler-Stalin pact. I was all alone in it, in def trying to defend it. Uh, I was only 10 or 11 years old, but we were very politicalized in those days. <laughs> we were all politicalized. We had a, a singer came to sing for us, politically left-wing and union and uh, songs and songs from the Appalachian miners' fights, but also humorous, witty songs, left-wing songs. And this singer sang them, and not only sang them, I was the only one who really 
<laughs> that were my songs. But he got the whole class, uh, not, uh, not only whole, the whole auditorium singing. And you know who it was? It was Pete Seeger. <laughs> his aunt was our history teacher. So she invited, he must have been one of the first of his concerts. I was lucky enough to hear. Uh, years later, I was his interpreter when he visited East Berlin, which was something nice. Also very, very nice. In any case, I grew up in this atmosphere. At high school, I won't go into the details. Uh, this, by the way, is not an autobiography. I've written an autobiography, which is also available in English and much better in German, because in English it's cut, but in, uh, it's, it's shortened. In German, it's expensive, but it's, not, it's uncut. But I have a little bit of it in here, too, of my, biography, my own biography. I, I uh, went to these various high schools, and one of them is wh where we had discussion groups. That, was, that must have been 10th grade, mostly. Um, every Wednesday, we'd invite a speaker and then tear him apart, uh, <laughs> depending, because the, 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 the club members who went there all the time, every Wednesday, divided basically into a a, a communist, pro-communist group, a group which that we didn't call it then, but one would say now social democratic group, a small Trotskyist group, and a small group which of course wasn't called that then either, but you would say more Zionist group. But the best speaker and, the mo and not only the best figure, but he was very handsome and very well-spoken, he was the communist. <laughs> and I became, he became my friend. And uh, one day came to me and said, say, don't you want to, do you want to join the Young Communist League? So I said, sure. I was, I think, 14, 13 or 14. And uh, uh, stayed in there so that uh, it, the Young Communist League changed its name in the middle of the war, just as the Communist Party dissolved and rechanged. And it became a, a broader, it was called American Youth for Democracy. I, 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 didn't want, I didn't like that, I didn't want to go, but when I did go to see one meeting, the, the chairperson was such a cute <laughs> and pretty young lady, by the way, an, a, a, an immigrant from Berlin, by the way, uh, Nina, that uh, oh, I went it the second time, and then the third time, and then I stayed around. <laughs> um, in any case, when I got to Harvard, I hadn't been there long before another fellow from Chicago sp uh, found, we found each other, and we started this AYD club, but we hadn't started, uh, had it for long before he said, hey, you're a red, aren't you? And I said, yeah, why? He said, well, sign this then. I said, what's that? Membership in the Communist Party. And I thought to myself, my God, do you, you have to be a member too? I didn't I, I was really rather naive on the subject. And not only that, going through my head, if I join this, I'm really possibly endangering my future career. Mm -hmm. Because this was only 19, summer of 45, but the Cold War had already begun. In 19, even before the World War was over. You could see it coming, and it got worse and worse and worse. With every year, I finished college then, 49, but it was already pretty tough at college, too. Also, for a few left-wing professors and teachers, it was tough. But he said, are you a red or aren't you? I said, oh, yeah, I am. He said, OK, 50 cents. You didn't have any worry about uh, anybody else. 50 cents, I was in. And we had a small group at Harvard. Uh, which was very active but secret because we were afraid of letting it be known that we were really communists. Uh, we were very active against racism, helping unions, helping some black candidates in, in the area. And, in, uh, and in, generally in priest, we had a wonderful demonstration right through Harvard Yard against the atomic war, against Francisco Franco. Uh, when I got finished, the, the person in Boston who was sort of a uh, in, in, in charge of us, so to say, the community connection, said, now about 10 of you are finishing Harvard now this year. We were about 35 in, as a whole. If nothing's found out about your communist past, you have possibly a good career. A Harvard diploma is worth a lot in the United States. It's, it's the most prestigious there is. But, have, you know, our party is supposed to be a working class party, but we don't have nearly enough working class people. Would any of you consider becoming working class workers? And three of us said yes, 
and I was one of them. So I went off after a while to Buffalo and worked as an unskilled laborer for a year and a half, uh, which I was never very good, very skilled at all, but I learned an awful lot from this. Uh, after, uh, I learned most of all because I was pretty lonely up there, although we had a group, a youth group there too. The youth group was a half white ex students like myself and half young black people from the ghetto of Buffalo. And because the center of the left wing movement in Buffalo was especially this one black family. Uh, the daughter had first become, uh, was uh, converted to, to left wing views. Uh, and she won her mother, and they had, had the mother had 10 kids, and all except the youngest and the oldest also became leftists and communists, plus their spouses. So this was a movement of its own. <laughs> <laughs> and this was my home away from home, really. And by the way, m most of them are no longer alive. This family, Lumpkin family, a wonderful family. That was a center there. Broken down old house in the middle of the ghetto was a, a wonderful center for, for everybody. Uh, there were two sons with daughters-in-law and, and others. Um, one of the sons married, the, one of them married a white woman, uh, also a leftist, and she is just about the only one left. And I saw her on my trip in Chicago. She's now 100 years old, and she was very proud at this Congress. She wore a big hundred on her back, <laughs> and she's still active. She leads the parade. And while I'm at it, I might mention that when I was picked up in Chicago, also by, by communists in this case, not always, but in Chicago it was with communists, by somebody driving a wonderful old Trabi, a Trabant. <laughs> and, and, and the license plate said Trabant. Was, that was the license plate, it was Trabant. So uh, to, get, to get back to me, I, I had worked a year, a year and a half in Buffalo, when I got drafted, that was the Korean War. I was just too young to get drafted in World War II, but no longer too young, so I got drafted. When you were drafted, you had to sign a statement. I am not and have never been a member of the following organizations, about 120, about 100, 110 of them were or had, had been left wing. Many of them were long dead. But I had been in about a dozen, and I was still in about a half a dozen, <laughs> including Spanish uh, relief for Spanish refugees, Southern Negro Youth Congress there was, and, th and for solidarity reasons. But if I said I was in them, there had been a law passed called the McCarran Act, which said if you, any member of any of these organizations, but of course especially the Communist Party, must report immediately to the police as a foreign agent. For every day he does not, he or she does not report, can be sentenced to up to $10,000 and 10 years in prison. No, five, year, five years in prison, which means after a week, seven days, 30, 35 years, and two weeks, 70 years, and the, the law was already six months old. Uh, uh, by the way, I should say, nobody ever registered under this stupid law, which was ruled unconstitutional in the 1960s. But it was still there, and I was frankly scared about this. Should I sign this thing? Should I not sign it? Nobody had, could advise me. I was one of the first to get drafted among left. I said, ah, two years service. If I keep my mouth shut, maybe they won't check. I, I signed, and I have never been. And tried to keep my mouth shut, which has always been a difficult thing for me to do mm -hmm. all my life. I was very lucky. I was not sent to Korea. I was sent to Bavaria, the uh, beautiful little town of Batoltz, which is very beautiful, but very small for a New Yorker. <laughs> despite the beautiful Alps there. Uh, so that I was glad to spend three months in Munich at a course, which was a course for radio. Maybe because of that, maybe because for another reason. Oh, it's closed, doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, years later, I got under the Freedom of Information Act in the United States, I got material about me which the FBI and the Army equivalent had, had collected, 1,100 pages. It's a pile. And among them, this is just a copy, of course, was this one. It's just a copy. It, uh, it looked a little different. The, the top lines up here, I've got it upside down, were a denunciation of me that I had been a left-wing radical at Harvard. Of course, I don't know who it was. I have suspicions, but I don't know who it was. 
I have suspicions because I had two diff three different roommates. Uh, two of them changed during the four years, but the one who didn't change was a good friend, told me at a reunion, he said, you know, the, the FBI was here asking about you. And he said, I didn't know where you are, but the interesting thing is they knew of conversations we'd had in these, in our dormitory rooms. So that I have my own thoughts about that. In any case, I landed in Bavaria. I had only five or six months left to go. And then I got the letter from the Pentagon saying, you are in one, two, three, four, five, six organizations. They didn't mention the, C the Communist Party. I think they didn't want to, they wanted to protect their, their people in there maybe, I don't know. But they had Spanish and so forth. Report to the judge on next Monday, the nearest judge, which was then Nuremberg, because we had moved to Fürth. Um, report next Monday. For this, there was also a fine, not per day, but in general, a fine up to 10,000 in five years. And I panicked, frankly. I did not want to spend five years in a military prison. Uh, so what I decided to take off, which is what I did. I deserted. I deserted uh, on the Sunday, the day before I was supposed to go to the judge. I took off. I didn't know how to go. I didn't, I was not too far from Hof, from the, near the, but I didn't want to wander around a boundary where I didn't know where it was and, and get picked up. Then it would really be bad. I went in some place a sharp line and found one in, uh, in Linz, Austria. I went to Linz in Austria, where the Down, uh, which is on the Danube. And the Danube then and there, at that particular stretch in those years, was the dividing line between the Soviet and American zone. So I hoped to find a paddle boat. First of all, I, I had trouble finding the Danube. I got there in the evening, and I couldn't ask anybody in uniform. They'd say, what the hell does he want the Danube for? So I, I, I thought, maybe I'll find it. I, I, I didn't find it, and finally I fell asleep in, the, in a wooded area. When I woke up, it was light. I said, now I better get out, because my pass was already over. So I, I did find it. I didn't find a paddle boat, so I swam across. And, uh, and uh, uh, expected to find lots of armed Soviet tanks or soldiers Nobody. It was a sunny Sunday in August. I couldn't find even an Austrian. It, it was absolutely dead. No cars, no nothing at, along the river there. So I hid for a while. Once in a while, a rickety old car would come by, but no, no Soviets until finally, since I had no shoes anymore, I'd throw my shoes away, my jacket, my shirt was torn. I looked a mess. Uh, a, a Austrian police picked me up. And I said, I don't know German. I did already know German. I said, I don't know, Soviets. I didn't trust the Austrian police, which was wise of me. They took me to the Soviets. The Soviets took me to their headquarters of, in Austria, which was near Vienna in Baden. They locked me up for two weeks in a cell in the cellar until they knew what to do with me. It was interesting. I tell about that in here, too. It was rather amusing in some ways, how I communicated with the guard, who probably wasn't supposed to talk with me. But I, he, was, he was bored, and I was certainly bored in that cell. I knew about 10 or 20 words of Russian. So I went to him. He was standing in front of a, a bar door, he said, but with a window, you know. I got charged. I said, I said first, Amerikansky communist. Oh, that. <laughs> then I tried to carry on the conversation. What can I say? I said, uh, Anna Karenina? <laughs> you know the book? He said, oh. At yeah, first, he didn't understand because I pronounced it wrong, of course. He said, oh, Anna Karenina. It means, I read it. It's good. <laughs> then I thought, now what else do I know? <laughs> Words, you know? And I knew some films. I knew there was a Soviet, very wonderful Soviet film called Gulliver, the new Gulliver, with puppets. So I said, Gulliver, Gulliver, oh, Gulliver, I've seen it. It's good. <laughs> and this went on for about 10 minutes. We learned, we had a literary and film discussion. <laughs> and I learned some. I learned some Russian words. As I mentioned in the book, most important word to learn was ubornaya. That means toilet. <laughs> if you want to go to the toilet, you have to say ubornaya. Uh, after two weeks, they said, now you're getting out of there. <laughs> they apologized, basically. Now you get, not only that, they brought me a, a whole new suit, new shoes, shoes to hat. And he said, and for you, a red tie. <laughs> uh, and they, I didn't know where they were going to send me. 
I didn't really want to come to East Germany, but I didn't. <laughs> I was just glad that I wasn't. And they didn't tell me. They put me in a vehicle, a, we a weird vehicle. It was really a, basically a, 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 a regular car, but they had sort of built onto, a, onto it in back uh, seats for six, but with curtains. And we, and we drove at night through Vienna. I was a little worried because Vienna, you know, was a, 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 had five se uh, so sectors, not four, but five. British, American, French, Russian, or Soviet, and one international in the middle. Drove through to the Austrian, uh, to the border, and across the, uh, waiting, uh, across the border, and I looked a little through the window and I saw it in Czech, words in Czech. So I knew I was there. Am I going to stay in Czechoslovakia or Poland or East Germany? Well, we kept going through Czechoslovakia. I was hoping to stay in Czechoslovakia because I had been there already at the World Youth Festival in 1947. I already knew 100 words of Czech, in fact, I was proud to say. But they didn't stop. They passed by Prague. So Poland or East Germany? We got to Schmilke on the Elbe River, which was the GDR. And that's, they had another car. Guy got out, who, this one spoke English. He said, I hear you've been looking for, you want to read books. In, in this cell in Austria, they had only three books, which I read twice. Uh, so um, uh, he said, we've got lots of books. And they locked me up for two months in Potsdam. They had a special house, which was very, very pleasant. And I had an hour's walk in the garden, but otherwise it was restricted. Now, once they took me to departments where I got another outfit, <laughs> another set of clothes. And uh, they also asked me, they said, we want to go a little outing, since otherwise you're locked up in this house. We'll take you for a day's outing. Uh, it was the man who was in charge of me and a chauffeur, a, a driver of the car. He said, would you like to go to Sicilianhof or Sanssouci? Well, I didn't really know either of them. <laughs> Sanssouci sounded familiar, but I didn't know what that was. And Sicilianhof, I, I, I either knew or, fig or got that's where the Potsdam decision was, uh, uh, thing was made, and that was Truman, Stalin, Churchill, and then Adley. And they uh, uh, w would like to visit where Stalin was. That was 1952. Uh, so I didn't say. They decided, Cecilia and Hope, as it happened, the driver didn't find either of them. <laughs> we didn't see either one. <laughs> but after two months, they drove me to the town of Bautzen, in the southwest, in, in the southeast corner of the GDR, it's uh, it's famous for its penitentiary, all over Germany. But that had, uh, it's called the Gelbes Eiland, the Yellow Misery. It's very famous penitentiary, but uh, that had nothing to do with me, <laughs> luckily. It, it, but it, it's for many Germans, it's like being sent to Sing Sing, for the town of Sing Sing. You know, in any case, this is where they sent all deserters, uh, Western deserters. There were always about 30 to 40 Americans, British, French, North African who didn't want to go to Vietnam to fight for the French, or a sprinkling of a couple of Dutch and others. And there were about 30 or 40 of us. At first, I worked in a factory for f five months lung uh, hauling lumber, which gave me the possibility to compare with the United States. Then they asked me to run a clubhouse, a cultural director of a clubhouse for these foreigners. So they'd have tournaments and films and so forth, which I did for six months. And then they uh, offered, by this time it was no longer the Soviets, it was the GDR authorities, a, um, a special course, trades course. You could choose between uh, Schlosser, mechanic, painter, lathe operator, or one other. I chose lathe operator. In one year, I learned to operate a lathe machine. I'm very proud of it because I've always been a technical idiot. <laughs> but, but I still have the, the piece I had to finish, and I'm very proud of it, what I accomplished. However, I didn't, I didn't work as a lathe operator, probably best for me and for the economy. I got the chance to go to Leipzig to study journalism. And uh, at first, they, uh, they questioned me, the, uh, some professors, as to whether I could go there or not. Obviously, they were checking, first of all, what, what, did I know German well enough? which I did, was I educated enough to go to college and a background, which I had. And third of all, politically, they also, and they were satisfied on all counts. And they said, what would you like? And I said, what do you have? Uh, I, I thought first of American studies, history and literature, 
They said, yes, we have a very good department of that, which they did, but we also have a journalism course, three years, not four. Maybe you're interested in journalism. I said, yeah, I've always been interested in journalism. But when I got to the journalism school, they said, no, three years, we're now back to four years too. <laughs> so it was four years. By this time, however, I had the luck of my whole switchover from west to east. I had met my future wife. And I had met her in this town of Bautzen. At first, uh, when I got the news I could go to Leipzig, we quarreled. She said, you think I'm going to wait for you here while you're with all those pretty co-eds <laughs> in, in Leipzig? No, and wait for you for Christmas? No, no. And we broke up. But after a week, going to the movies alone and so forth, it was pretty lonely. Not only that, she had a nice warm apartment, my uh, room. My room was not he only had one of these old ovens, which I never learned to, uh, to heat up. In any case, so we got engaged. She went to Leipzig even before I got there. We got married a year later, and this saved me from homesickness for all those years, basically. Uh, almost, not 100%, but 95%, shall we say. Uh, at, Har at Leipzig, uh, now I'll, I, it's, I've talked so long, yes, it's almost an hour. Uh, I haven't said anything of the things I really wanted to say about the GDR. <laughs> uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, by the way, I had four different jobs. One of them was with this newspaper, which I passed around. Could whoever has it, you could pass it back, perhaps. Uh, yeah. This with this copy. Um, this was a, a bulletin which I, which I uh, was assistant editor for. It was an English language bulletin put out in East Berlin with government help about life in the GDR, but of course more more pro than con. Uh, definitely pro, but not so stupidly this kind. The, a lot of the literature is, but cleverly and interesting, usually quoting people from the West who had been here and either found that things were not really the way they had been told, so terrible, or who made such a stupid fool of themselves, you know, the kind who, as soon as they crossed the, at Brandenburg Gate, suddenly the sun disappeared, you know, <laughs> and everybody looked grim. And they couldn't find anything to buy, of course, because they never... Somehow, several, they, they walked up Friedrichstrasse, which had no, not many stores then, but they missed Leipzigerstrasse, which was full of very fancy stores. Somehow they missed that. In any case, I worked there for five years. I worked for three years setting up a Paul Robeson archive for the great American singer and actor Paul Robeson. And then I became a freelancer and traveled all over the country, uh, uh, first writing articles, about the United States developments, and then talking all over the country. This was my job. What did I find, and, why, uh, and what my, were my feelings? I found, first of all, of course, it was not a, 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 a glorious utopia, which I had not really expected, uh, but nor was it a hell's hole, as I might have expected if I'd read the press on me. Uh, it was the GDR, which I think almost none of you experienced, if I'm not mistaken. You're either uh, not old enough or lived, didn't live there. It was a very complicated place. It was not as simple as it's now presented. I found five different, uh, I think it was five different kinds of people. I found one group, not so small, who really were from the heart hated fascism and were for socialism and wanted to build up the GDR. This is the kind of people I gravitated to and became close with, uh, including as when I came to Berlin, not so much in Leipzig, well, in Leipzig too, but especially in Berlin, people who had emigrated and come back. And of course, they were people who came back because they were leftists. Um, many very interesting and fine people. Uh, a second group, also had as a goal the idea of socialism, but they were the narrow-minded, dogmatic kind, not like this first group. They, anybody who, who, who said the wrong thing, who took the wrong, or who was, was cr critical, somehow was, was deviating. And in other words, these dogmatists who I ran into also which was curious because, of course, basically, in a way, I was on the same side as they were, but they could be very unpleasant. Uh, I should add here, this was 
in general, the kind who are in leadership positions and never really learn to talk to the other people. In general, I'm generalizing greatly, you have to. The third group were the group who spoke wonderfully, pro GDR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they were the careerists. They were out just to, to make good. And so they, they talked the talk. That's where the kind people used to joke about. They wore the party button at work and during the day when they got home. <laughs> this was a third kind. A fourth kind, I would say, is a kind you find in any country. The idiots and stupid people, the Dummköpfe, you know, you find them any place. And the fifth kind were the kind who really hated the GDR or, or in various degrees. Some of them just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Some of them really hated it, were pro at an hour in those days, pro-Western, included often people who had forced to leave Pol what was now Poland or Czechoslovakia or other places, had lost their homes. Uh, sometimes uh, old homes, sometimes uh, that had been seized from other Polish people. Uh, they hated everything about the system here. Uh, many of them also, I won't say they were the same, but the overlapping was great, who still had fascist ideas. Uh, often, not always. Uh, you had ver and in all of these categories, you had lots of variation, and people changed. And you didn't, when you talk to somebody, they didn't tell you which group they were in. You meet a for somebody, you get to talking to somebody, you start talking, trying to feel them out. Are, are they really, with, uh, or is it phony, or are they stupid, or are they really against you? And this was, stayed true for the whole 38 years I was in the GDR. You had these differing groups. I would estimate that, or I did estimate, and it's only a wild personal estimate, that over the years you generally had about 15, 20 percent of the, of the population of the GDR who were really all for the GDR and socialism. You had about 15 or 20 percent who were absolutely anti. Of course, a lot of these people went west until the wall came up. An awful lot of them went west, but not all of them. Uh, 15 or 20 percent, I'd, I'd say, speculate, were very much anti. The remaining, what is it, 60, I think, is left about, they vacillated. If they got a new car after waiting a long time, or a new apartment after waiting a long time, or had a, a, a raise, then they tended to be more pro. If they had a fight with a boss, or they d were turned down on a trip to the West, or didn't get that apartment they were hoping for, they're anti. In fact, it was interesting that in a country like the United States, or today, in, in any country, if things go wrong, if things go bad, either in your personal life or, or the train is on, not on time or something, you curse either, if you're a Republican, you curse the Democrats, if you're a Democrat, you curse the Republicans or Trump, or you, or you, you curse those Yankees, or you curse those Jews, or you curse those uh, foreigners, or something like that. In the GDR, if something went wrong, you always had only one place to curse, the, the top leadership of the SED and, and their system. Uh, this was an, an interesting phenomenon. In any case, I, and now I'll try to close up, I supported the GDR all the time, but I had, Lots and lots and lots of worries, problems, difficulties where I really almost tore my hair out. You're constantly running into <laughs> shit flying around, uh, varying kinds, often just plain stupidity, as I mentioned. Sometimes, especially from the kind who's, who, 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 who either were dogmatic or careerists, were tough on anybody that that looked as if they might be troublesome. Uh, this meant often that these careerists were subject to criticism if they had any kind of job and they didn't want to be criticized. So that honest people who really fought for the GDR but were trying to improve it with criticism, they could get slammed, aha, you're pro-Western. And this was true through the arts. 
But here I want to point out what made me like the GDR from the very start. I noticed from the very start the Nazis were gone. The people who make opioids, the people who make Unilever, the, and especially the people like Bayer, BASF, who had built and run outfits, were all gone completely. This made me like the GDR till today. Second of all, connected with that, there were the schools, the courts, the police, all administration had the Nazis were thrown out. This meant that there were almost no teachers at first, because the, most teachers had been Nazis. My wife told terrible tales how nasty and brutal they could be, and, and, and hard, hitting. Uh, it meant that my brother-in-law came back from a prison of war. He had been a soldier. And when he got back to the village, they said, hey, you like football, don't you? He said, yeah, you're pretty good at football. Why don't you teach sports? at the school. <laughs> so they convinced him to teach sports. Before long, they said, couldn't you teach geography too? <laughs> and I think history or some, something else came along. This was the, what they had to do. Uh, but these early, they're called Neulehrer, these first teachers who really had to learn on the job. They were sometimes just a week or two ahead of their pupils. They became a core, really the best teachers in the GDR because they were emotionally tied to fighting the fascists and to building this up. They were a real core. Some of them got caught after the Vende, after the downfall of the GDR, and were thrown out of their jobs shortly before reaching a pension age. Um, as I say, the courts, all these judges, the Nazi judges in West Germany, and I, that's in my book, None of the Nazi judges were punished in any way. I think two military judges were punished. The, the courts were run by Nazis. The police departments were not only not Nazis, but Gestapo, Gestapo men. We, we found the facts, and they're in here too. The military, all the generals had been Wehrmacht generals. And some of them, the nastiest killers of, 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 uh, in Greece, whole villages wiped out, and Russia asked completely. They were in power here. In fact, the first three heads of the West German army, the first one, we have his, his statements, seven villages in Greece, all the male inhabitants were killed. All the male inhabitants were killed. And he did that all over the place. The, uh, but he had some alibi that he had, he'd once been a little trouble. The, the second one in charge had been the squad leader of one of the air condor Air Force groups sent to Spain to fight for Hitler and Franco and Mussolini. His squad bombed Guernica. You know the, you know the painting Guernica. His squad, they don't think he may not have been in it at the moment, but it was his squad which bombed Guernica. He was the second commander, no, he was the third commander of the Bundeswehr. The second commander was Friedrich Furch. He had been in, on the Leningrad front. He had been part of the siege of Leningrad under which one and a half million people died of hunger and starvation. He had been in charge of that, and while in charge of that, he had ordered the destruction of the ancient, ancient cities of Novgorod and Pskov. Ruin, just, just. He became the second head of the, uh, of the Bundeswehr. And all the rest of the officers were similar. I should point out, as I do here, in the GDR, they had to build up an army too. They took nine former Wehrmacht generals who had all of them during the war as prisoners of war switched sides and become anti-Hitler. And they got rid of them as soon as they could within a year or two. But they needed some because they didn't have enough military leadership there. But this is another story uh, which I, I tell in detail. And, but uh, from the schools to the courts to the police departments to the diplomats, this thing I passed around, all West German diplomats had been in the Nazi party. The one we exposed, we showed all of them, one of them was particularly interesting. He, as a, as a council, a legation council, he hadn't yet become a, an ambassador, in Holland, during the occupation of Holland by the Nazis, he reported proudly to Berlin, in our first 11 months, we succeeded in getting rid of one third of Holland's Jews. This man was now, had now become ambassador to Switzerland. Until we exposed it, 
him and the others, but he was the worst, one of the worst cases, where we had not only his Nazi party membership number, but this quotation of his. He was removed, he had to be removed then, either because of England pressure or the Swiss. What did they do? They sent him as ambassador to Argentina, which was then fascist run. So we, um, this made me feel close to the GDR too. Uh, another reason I felt close to the GDR, in those years, in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, etc., plenty going on in the world. In 73, Allende was thrown out by fascist Pinochet. Which side was the GDR on? It's clear. Allende. Which side did the Bundesrepublik support? Pinochet. Strauss went there especially, to, and one big company said, now we finally have good conditions to build. In Vietnam, the GDR supported and helped rebuild a town in North Vietnam. The, uh, Bonn, West Germany, of course, was on the side of the Americans. Uh, not militarily, but otherwise. In Algeria, who's, uh, the same. West Germany trained French officers. The GDR supported the Algerian freedom movement. And most interesting of all, Southern Africa. Because while West Germany was supporting the apartheid governments there and sending weapons, sending these military trucks or military vehicles with armed vehicles, the GDR was first of all helping refugee youngsters and giving them a training here from Namibia in this case, but was also publishing the exile newspaper of the ANC, the African National Congress, and the uh, Namibians here, I think for free, publishing their newspaper in every way supporting them. In other words, there was, uh, and Franco, of course, West Germany was buddy-buddy with Franco. The GDR was not. This made me feel close to the GDR. And finally, and I think I'll close up with this, I didn't come, f I had been in uh, uh, West Germany as a soldier nine months only, but enough to look around and to learn German, by the way, in those nine months. I really worked hard to learn German. But basically, I came from the United States. And therefore, some things in the, United, in the GDR were really remarkable to me. What I mean is the social system, the fact that you paid a certain tax on your income, not a big tax. And for that, every medical and dental expense was com completely covered. You didn't pay a penny. Uh, you went to a doctor. You made an appointment. You went to a doctor. That was it. The medicines he prescribed for you, free, not a penny. Glasses, not a penny. I didn't need hearing aids then at that time, but the same. Um, if you were, I had, I, I got hepatitis. I was in the hospital nine weeks with hepatitis. Of course, I didn't pay a penny for that. At the end of it, I got a four week rehab in a beautiful estate outside near Potsdam. It had once belonged to the Siemens family. Now it was a rehab, four weeks, all the mud baths and bubble baths and, and exercise, et cetera. And of course, all for nothing, including transportation and 90% of my pay. A year later, to check up on possible liver damage from my hepatitis, I was sent to Karla Vivari in Czechoslovakia, the same basis, free 90%. My wife went to three different rheumatism cures, all of them four weeks. One was in the Polish mountains, one was in the Hartz mountains. Uh, this, for an American, was just, not only that, college. I went to college, of course, completely free. I, was, I, had, a, I had perks. Foreign, uh, all the students got, in those days, 180 or 240 marks a month, which was not much. But it covered, first of all, tuition was free, it covered uh, all your meals and your dormitory expenses, and left a little bit over, left over, say, to go home at Christmas, etc. Uh, not much more, but it covered all expenses, which meant that no students, when I was there, worked next to their job, uh, studies. Not one. Uh, some of them may have worked in their summer vacation to make a little extra money, but nobody worked while we were while we were studying, and. Of course, nobody had any debts when they were finished. 
I contrast these things with the situation in the United States, which is pretty horrific. I have just simply quotations. It's pretty horrific. People have thirty, forty thousand dollar debts all their lives up into pension age, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, and medical expenses, of course, can have ruined thousands and thousands of families every year, cost them their homes, cost them their everything. And so I compare this and end uh, and uh, child care free. Some of the vacations for the kids were not very long, three weeks only, but almost free in the countryside or the, someplace. Uh, abortions after 1972, until then they were forbidden. After 72, also permitted and free. Uh, what else? Uh, basically, that covers most of the things that worry people. Um, there are a few more which I could think of. By the way, I, I mentioned that I had perks. Foreign students, we got a little, I got 300 a month instead of 240 or 180 because I had no place to send my laundry as the others did, etc. In any case, um, these are the things which made me appreciate the GDR, but most of all, the fact that they not only threw out Siemens and Bayer and BASF and the Deutsche Bank, et cetera, et cetera, and Krupp and Tucson, who now I see their name on my, on my elevator and then the escalator when I go at Krupp Tucson. And I, I know, because the research I did on this magazine, what terrible, terrible crimes they committed. It's just unbelievable crimes they committed. And now they're back here, they're back, which makes me still bitter and leads me, uh, and, and I see the fact that these companies, especially the American companies, but the German companies too, and the British and the others too, that they are getting fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer taking control of more and more, so that you have the whole pharma industry worldwide, basically five or six companies running it. Fast food, I heard in BBC this morning, they expect 50 million obese uh, kids within some years because of fast foods. They know it, and they, from Coke to the uh, McDonald's and donuts, etc. they know that they're poisoning people. The same now with the, with the, with the cigarette. They knew this um, jewel was poisoned too, uh, and, and opoids, so that, um, and worst of all, they're cornering autos, less and less and less companies, and with absolutely no conscience, as we know that they purposely deceived the whole world with this, this trick with their uh, uh, emissions. Worst of all, two groups. One is the weapons, armaments, who are also five or six dominate the field, and it's obvious that they want to sell more and more, and the way you sell more and more is to have wars and to prepare for wars. And the other is the, the ones controlling your mind, not only the media, Murdoch's and, and Springer's, et cetera, more and more, and Disney's, et cetera, but also Facebook, Flitter, Amazon, are more and more gaining real control of our, of, of our thinking. I've noticed it because of emails. I communicated with a, with a fellow in Greece. We just chatted in an email, Within three days, I got offers for a translation service, German, English, German, you know, obviously everything's red or covered. But they're able to control us politically, our thinking. These worry me greatly and lead me to the conclusion, and with that I really will uh, end, to the conclusion, it is necessary to fight for advances, every advance for pensioners, for children, for working people, who are now hit by more and more of these half jobs and insecure jobs and temp jobs, et cetera, to fight for the rights of, of working people in all fields. Uh, but there are three things menacing the world right now. One is the environment being ruined largely by these huge companies, oil, gas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, without regard to anybody except their profits. Uh, and especially as we're now finding the military are ruining it more than almost anybody else. Second of all, the fact that by 
force by destroying the southern continents they're f with wars and economically they're forcing more and more people from Africa and the, and the Near East especially but all and Latin America to come towards no USA and Europe where they are then used to turn the people there in a fascist direction and this threat of growing fascism is the second big menace I might mention my, uh, the a man at my the bank where I have my money chatted with me. He said, you know that depression in 2007, 2008? He said, that was like a car going 70, hitting a haystack. He said, the next one would be like a car doing 100, hitting a, uh, hitting a steel wall. I don't know if he's right or not. But the fact that when that happens, that the parties like the AFD and equivalents in other countries who had already in the East, 25% and 13% generally, will be able to have a terrific new uh, force of people who blame it on those foreigners who are taking everything from us. And this is the second big danger. And the third big danger, as I've already mentioned, the fact that if you look at the map, how these same forces in the United States have moved closer and closer and closer to the Russian border so that they're maneuvering with military right in Estonia. They're building highways and bridges which can take heavy uh, equipment to the Polish border. The danger in Ukraine is still there and in Syria. And they're really closing in in a, in a circle around Russia, regardless of what thinks of Russia or Putin. Obviously, it's a question of defending their existence against forces who want to, as I see it, take over the world and their step was step by step, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Syria, the next is Iran, and then is Russia. That's what I fear mostly, and at any point it can blow up and we have atomic war. These three things endanger us all, and I see as the only real answer is these, to get rid of these big shots, these big companies, just to take over. Now, by that, I, I reject the idea of these w revolutionaries who act as if tomorrow is the revolution and start waving flags and perhaps breaking windows and, and cars, burning cars, and calling for the revolution. This is not only nonsense, but is, is I think, done by either adventurers who are just as loud at a football match or under the influence of either something or other, or provocateurs, as we know, who are also involved, who are really leading the way. You know that case in Heiligen Dam some years ago, where the man who led the way in throwing stones at the cops, they had, he, he, he got, come on, boys, let's get those cops. Uh, up until then, it had been peaceful. While throwing the first stones, his mask slipped, and one of the others with him looked at him, he said, my God, that's the same guy who arrested me in Hanover two months ago. <laughs> so, uh, I think they're crazy. But I also think it's wrong to see only the improvements you can make now, which you have to fight for, improvements for living standards, but never to lose sight of the main goal, which is nobody should be making money off the work of anybody else, and certainly not ruling the roost and certainly not sitting up in, high, in skyscrapers in paneled office rooms deciding these 10,000 will go there, and these 10,000 will be thrown out of work, and these 10,000 will go to Southeast Asia, and we'll just close down on these to end that. And I think that we should never lose sight of the goal of getting rid of them altogether. And I'm going to close with that, and thank you.